Good day. Welcome to another session of Fog Accountancy Tutorials. Today, we are going to continue our series on consolidated statement of financial position by taking a practical question. A practical question that involves the intra-group adjustments as well as the fair value adjustment. And so without wasting my time, I want to go straight onto the question, read the question, we analyze it together, and then we solve it together on the board. All right. The following summarized statement of financial position relates to Evelyn and its subsidiary, Sophia Limited, as of 31st December 2013. So we have two separate financial statements for Evelyn and Sophia Limited. So we have property, plant, and equipment, 33,400, 2,400, respectively, in Ghana cities. We have investment in Sophia and Evelyn Limited, 24,000. And then we have current assets. And the current assets, we have inventory, 11,500 and 6,800 for both. And then we have trade receivables. Evelyn is 8,500. Sophia is 5,900. We have cash and cash equivalent. 5,000 Ghana CDs for Evelyn, 2,900 for Sophia. Giving us a total asset of 82,400 and 36,000 respectively. And then under equity, we have stated capital. Ordinary shares at one Ghana CDs each, 40,000 and 10,000 respectively. Retained earnings, 25,200. 15,800 respectively. And then we have trade payables, which is 17,200 for Evelyn and 10,200 for Sophia, giving us total equity and liabilities of 82,400 and 36,000 respectively. So we look at the additional information. Now, additional information, first one says A, Evelyn acquired 80% of Sophia on 1st January 2011 when the balance on the retained earnings of Sophia was 11,600 Ghana cities. So that is the pre-acquisition income surplus of the subsidiary. Then we continue. At the date of acquisition, it was determined that the plant of Sophia had a fair value of 1,000 Ghana cities in excess of its carrying amount. The remaining useful life was 10 years at this time. This fair valuation has not been reflected in the separate financial statement of Sophia. So that is for the second additional information. Let us read the third one. Evelyn sells goods to Sophia at a markup of 25%. As a result, at the reporting date, Sophia's records showed a payable due to Evelyn of 1,100 Ghana cities. However, this disagreed to Evelyn's limited receivable balance of 1,500 Ghana cities due to cash in transit. D. During 2013, Evelyn sold goods to Sophia for 3,000 Ghana cities. Sophia still held one third of these goods in inventory as of 31st December 2013. E. It is the policy to record the NCI holding at fair value, which was deemed to be 5,000 Ghana cities at the date of acquisition. And then the last one, F, an impairment loss of 2,000 Ghana cities should be recognized against the goodwill at the reporting date. Required, prepare the consolidated statement of financial position of Evelyn Limited Group as at 31st December 2013. Okay, so this... It's a very simple question, like I always say. It may look bulky for you, but I see it to be a very simple question. We are going to analyze and you are going to appreciate its simplicity. Now, what I want you to understand, first of all, is that um, this is a parent subsidiary question with intra-group adjustment. We are going to solve it together, but I want us to go back to the question, analyze it again from the additional information. As for the statement of financial position, we are very familiar with whatever is in there. Let us go back and do some analysis again from the additional information to enhance our understanding of the question before we start solving them or calculating the things that are important to calculate before preparing the consolidated statement of financial position. So going back to the additional information, we are told that Evelyn acquired 80% of Sophia. So that is about the group structure, okay? So if Evelyn acquired 80%, we are fortunate 
to be given the group structure at a go. This is the easiest you can get. They've told you the percentage holding straight away without asking you to solve and find it yourself. So 80% is a group structure, 80% uh, for the parent, and then NCI takes the remaining 20%. That is the group structure. So we are going to start with working of the group structure. So I've already told you that that is the first thing you should do. So let us begin. So workings. So the first working we are going to look at is the group structure. I told you that is the first thing we do. So under the group structure, we will say parent or Evelyn Limited holds 80%, and the non-controlling interest holds 20%, giving us a total of 100%. So that is the first working we must do. At all times, you always have to establish the group structure before you proceed with whatever you are going to do. Now, mind you, I said we are going to do this analysis before we start the workings, but this is too obvious. That is why I had to do that first before we proceed to analyze the rest of the additional information. All right. So we continue with the A again. We are told Evelyn acquired 80% of Sophia on 1st January 2011. When the balance on the retained earnings of Sophia was 11,600. So that is the pre-acquisition income surplus of the subsidiary, Sophia Limited. So Evelyn acquired at the date, it was 1st January 2011. That is the acquisition date. Now, mind you, the reporting date is 31st December 2013. So it has been three years since the acquisition. It was 1st January 2011. We are consolidating on 31st December 2013, according to the question. So the whole of 2011, whole of 2012, and the whole of 2013. So this is three years since acquisition. And at the date of acquisition, it was 11,600 pre-acquisition retained earnings. Okay, so on the statement of financial position, the retained earnings of Sophia, the subsidiary, is 15,800. So there have been a post-acquisition retained earnings, which we should look at. But I told you that that is not the only aspect to look at the post-acquisition profit. We are going to do the net asset list of the subsidiary at acquisition date and at the reporting date in order to estimate the post-acquisition addition to the profit then we'll see how to apportion that. So that is how to analyze the first additional information. Now, the second one has to do with B. It says that at the date of acquisition, it was determined that a plant of Sophia had a fair value of 1,000 in excess of its carrying amount. So that is the fair value um, adjustment. So he says the remaining useful life was 10 years at this time. The fair valuation has not been reflected in the separate financial statement of Sophia. All right, so whenever there is a fair value adjustment, I told you that you need to be mindful of the date of the fair valuation. This is at the date of acquisition. We are told that at the date of acquisition, the fair value was one million in excess. So this fair valuation was done at the date of acquisition. And the second thing you should ask is, is it the parents or the subsidiaries uh, Assets that is being fair valued. When we check the revaluation is done for Sophia, according to the question, he said that Sophia, so it's from the subsidiary. And because this fair valuation is of the subsidiary, it's going to affect the net asset list, like I told you in a previous video. So we are going to prepare the net asset list, and then we are going to be mindful of this uh, 1,000, which is the increase or an upward revaluation of a plant which was not captured. According to the question, it was not captured in the books. And it was done at the date of acquisition. Okay? And then we are also told that the remaining useful life of that plant is 10 years. And so if it was done at the date of acquisition, and then we have already come three years after the date of acquisition, and we are consolidating today after three years, and it had a useful life of 10 years then, then it means that three years depreciation has already been charged on this revaluation surplus. And we need to also factor that on the calculation of the net assets at the, of the subsidiary at the date of acquisition and the reporting. We need to do those adjustments just as I explained in the part five of this video. So we are going to also pay attention to that in our workings. Now let's just analyze the third additional information. It says that Evelyn sells goods to Sophia at a markup of 25%. So they have given us a markup. It may not mean anything for now, but let us know that we will use it later. Then as a result, at the reporting date, Sophia's record showed a payable due to Evelyn of 1,100. 
However, this disagreed to Evelyn's receivable balance of 1,500 due to cash in transit. So this is what I was trying to explain, okay? That if you check the books of um, Evelyn, they have receivable to Sophia, a receivable from Sophia, 1,500. Then under the current liabilities, pay under payables, Sophia also has 1,100 as payable to Evelyn. Okay, now we are told that the difference of 400 is due to cash in transit. And so this figure will be added to cash. But we are going to cancel off this because of the intra-group adjustments. We are not supposed to owe each other. So they, both the 1,500 and the 1,100 will not appear. But the difference of 400 is what we need to add to our cash in transit because we've been told from the question that it is cash in transit. All right, then we continue. The next one, we have already been told about a markup of 25%. D says that during 2013, Evelyn Limited sold goods to Sophia for 3,000. Sophia still held one third of the goods in inventory as of 31st December 2013. So that is a very important point that you should take note. Now, there were sales of 3,000. Now, the, the fact that there were sales of 3,000 is not even the problem. The focus here is to determine the unrealized profit on the, on the sale. Now, they made sales for 3,000. We need to get the unrealized profit. We are told that one third remains unsold. So one over three times the 3,000 will result in 1,000. So 1,000 remains unsold. Now, what is the unrealized profit on this 1,000? If you go back and read carefully, you'll notice that we are told that Sophia, Evelyn, sorry, Evelyn sold to Sophia for 3,000. So she's, they sold for 3,000. It means that this is already the selling price. This is not the cost. This is the sales value. Okay? If it was the cost, it would have been maybe the goose is worth of 3,000. They sold it at a markup of this amount. But this time, they sold the goose for 3,000. So the 3,000 is representing the sales value or the selling price. And we have sold one third of this. So 1,000 is still about the selling price or the sales value. So this 1,000 is the sales value. So we need to apply the rate on this to get the unrealized profit on the remaining 1,000. But we have been given a markup of 25%. This is where you should take note. The markup is 25%. Meanwhile, we have been given a sales value. And I told you that markup moves with the cost. Margins move with the sales value. Instead of the markup, we need a margin to apply on the sales value. If you don't understand this, you need to go back and revise how to change markup and, uh, to margin and margin to markup and when they apply. I said I have a video on that. It's a 19-minute video. You can go back and verify. And so before we can apply this rate of 25% on the 1,000, we need to convert this from markup to margin. If you apply 25% straight on the 1,000, whatever figure you have will be wrong. You're going to get 250, and that is a wrong figure. But when you have to convert it to margin, it will be 25 over 125. You bring back the 25 down to add to the 100, and then you multiply by 1,000, and that is going to give you 200, meaning that our unrealized profit is 200. This is not the working, actually. I'm going to present it well for you. I'm just trying to let you understand for the analysis we are doing, okay? So the unrealized profit is supposed to be 200, and you got it by converting the markup to margin before applying on the sales value. It is very, very important that you need to go back and revise on markups and margins. All right, so that is how to go about establishing the unrealized profit. And in this case, it was a parent that sold to the subsidiary. So we are not going to have any issue with NCI. And then we continue. The next one, E, says, it is the policy to record the NCI holding at fair value, which was deemed to be 5,000 at the date of acquisition. So we all know how to treat the NCI at fair value. We are going to use this to calculate the goodwill, okay? And also we will need it in the estimation of the NCI at reporting date. So we all know how to use the fair value of NCI. And the final one is about the impairment. An impairment loss of 2,000 should be recognized against the goodwill at reporting date. Now, we are told that, you no, know, we all know that goodwill should be calculated at the date of acquisition, okay? So if we calculate the goodwill for acquisition date, we have gone three years from that date. So at the reporting date, goodwill have impaired by 2,000 Ghana cities. So before we report the goodwill on the face of the financial statement, we need to subtract this 
impairment from the goodwill that we are going to present on the financial statement. And this impairment of goodwill is a loss that is also going to be charged against the income surplus. Of course, this is a goodwill for the group. And so NCR will also suffer a portion of the loss, just as the income surplus of the group will also suffer a percentage of the loss. So we are going to apportion the loss according to the percentage holding so that each of them will suffer, both the group, uh, the parent company, and then the NCI will all suffer their loss. All right. So this is it with the uh, additional information analysis. So what I'm going to do next is that I'm going to clean this and I'm going to do proper presentation. So we are going to deal with the big four. We have already spoken about the big four, which is the group structure, the goodwill on acquisition date, the non-controlling interest as reporting date, and then the group income surplus as reporting date. But we have introduced a fifth one, which is a net asset list, which is very important to help us estimate the post-acquisition profit. Also, we will need the net asset list at acquisition date to make the calculation of the goodwill very easier. So I'm going to first of all prepare the net asset list at acquisition date. And then from there, I'm going to prepare the goodwill and then in that order. When we are done, then we prepare the consolidated statement of financial position. So let us um, go through that together. Okay. We are done with the first one, which is the group structure. So we are moving on to the net asset list of the subsidiary. So working to net assets list of Sophia Limited. So we'll look at it at acquisition date and then at reporting date. So show my currency sign in Ghana CD. All right, so we are going to look at the net asset list of the subsidiary, both at acquisition date and at reporting date. So we are going to begin with the stated capital of the subsidiary. Please, this is only for the subsidiary. Take note. So at the acquisition date, the stated capital of the subsidiary, nothing is said about it. So we assume it has been the same from the acquisition date. And then according to the question, it's 10,000 Ghana cities. So we have 10,000 cities for acquisition. And then at the reporting date, it remains 10,000 Ghana cities. And then we look at the retained earnings, which is the income surplus. So retained earnings. Now, we are told from the additional information, the first one that Evelyn acquired 80 percent of Sophia on 1st January 2011, when the balance on retained earnings was 11,600. So we can all see that at acquisition, it was 11,600. But on the reporting date is what we have on the financial position statement, which is 15,800. So retained earnings at acquisition date is 11,600. At reporting date is 15,800 for the subsidiary. Very, very important that we do this. Now, there are no other items of equity on the statement of financial position. But let us remember that there was a revaluation in the ad ad additional information. And I told you that the fair value adjustment was for the subsidiary. And therefore, it will have uh, also a place on the net asset list. If it was for the parent, it will not come into the net asset list of the subsidiary. But because the fair value adjustment was for the subsidiary, we need to show that. And we are told that at the date of acquisition, it was determined that the plant of Sophia had a fair value of 1,000 in excess of its carrying amount. So that is 1,000. The remaining useful life was 10 years at this time. The fair valuation has not been reflected in the separate financial statement of Sophia. So we need to show it has not reflected till now. So what we are trying to say is that there was an upward revaluation of an asset, which also increases the net asset list. And so we are going to say fair value or fair valuation, or you can say revaluation surplus, any way you want to call it. At acquisition date is 1,000, and at reporting date will also be 1,000. Even though depreciation will reduce this, I'm going to show you the depreciation adjustment. But what I want you to understand is the fact that this was done at acquisition date according to the adjustment information. Now, if it was done at reporting date, there will be nothing here. We would have, we would have brought all the 1,000 here. But because it was done at acquisition date, we assume that it is still there till now. So we show it also at reporting date. But we need to reduce that of the reporting date by the depreciation effect. Okay. So what we have to do is that we will say that there should be a depreciation 
adjustment on the revaluation. Okay, so what we are trying to say is that this 1,000 has been there, according to the additional information, it has a 10 years use, remaining useful life. But we have come three years of that 10. And so if you divide 1,000 by 10, you are going to have 100 Ghana cities as your annual depreciation charge. And this 100 has gone for three times. Okay, and so it's going to be 300. So the depreciation adjustment will be 300, which is going to reduce the net assets as a reporting date. Okay, so we are going to show workings that the depreciation adjustment is 1,000 times, 1,000 over 10 times 3, which is going to give us 300. And I'm going to show that in bracket. It's the same workings that I have done here. 10,000 over 10 is the 100, and then the times 3, giving us 3 years accumulated depreciation. And so this is how to do it. Now, someone, someone might decide to, just net this 300 of the 1,000 somewhere and then bring only 700 into the uh, net asset list. That is also going to give you the same balance, provided you show workings on how you arrived at your 700. Okay, so after doing this, there is nothing more to show from the net asset list. And so we just have to add them up and see the final balances. So what will be the total balance of the net asset list at the beginning? and what will be the total balance at the end. That is the most important for now, so that we can compare and find the post-acquisition increase in the net asset list. So the total for acquisition date is 22,600, and then the total for reporting date is 26,500. So this is the net asset list at acquisition and the total net asset at reporting date. So having been able to establish the totals, then we find the post-acquisition profit. So you see post-acquisition profit of Sophia Limited will be 26,500 Ghana cities minus 22,600. And that is going to give us 3,900. So this is the post-acquisition profit that we are going to share. Okay, this is a post acquisition which the group will have a share, an 80% share of this, and the non-controlling interest will have a 20% share of that. So that is how to establish the post acquisition changes in the net assets or the profit. Now, you see, like I told you, if you had looked straight away at the retained earning difference, you would have said the difference is 4,200, and that would have been a disaster because you would have forgotten that there is a depreciation adjustment that also needs to be made before arriving at the post-acquisition profit. So that is how to go by that. So always remember that right after your group structure, you deal with the next asset list. Please, if you follow these steps that I'm giving you very well, I don't think consolidation will be a, a, an issue for you. Again, so right after your group structure, look for your net asset list, and then we move on to prepare and estimate the goodwill on acquisition date. All right. Okay, so the next working will be working three, which will be goodwill. Goodwill computation. And goodwill computation will be easier than we expected because we are going to start with the cost of investment or the purchase consideration. And according to the question, the cost of investment can be found on the statement of financial position. That is investment in Sophia, 24,000. So the parent paid 24,000 to acquire the subsidiary. And then remember to add the fair value of NCI so that you have the good value for the entire business. So fair value of non-controlling interest. According to the question, the fair value of non-controlling interest was given as 5,000. So that is going to give us a total consideration of 29,000. And then we less fair value of net assets. And the fair value of net assets at acquisition date has already been calculated as 26,000. And so we subtract, sorry, 22,600. So we subtract 22,600 from the purchase consideration. And that is going to give us 6,400 
as our goodwill on acquisition. So the goodwill on acquisition is 6,400 Ghana cities. But remember that we had an information in F that says that an impairment loss of 2,000 should be recognized against the goodwill. So having established this goodwill that you have gotten is goodwill on acquisition date. But as reporting date, you need to show the impairment. So you now say less impairment loss. And the impairment loss is 2,000 Ghana cities. So when you subtract the impairment, you have a final goodwill. So this is the goodwill at reporting date. So the goodwill at reporting date will be 4,400 Ghana cities. So this is how to go by the goodwill computation as well. Very, very simple, very easy. So we move on to prepare the non-controlling interest at reporting date, as well as the group income surplus at reporting date. And then we can prepare the consolidated statement of financial position. Most of the uh, intra-group adjustments will not be done in the workings, but it will be done on the statement of financial position. We are going to show workings in brackets. So let us stick to our big five. All right. OK, so the next working is to find the non-controlling interest. Anyway, you can do any of them first, either the group income surplus or this. So non-controlling interest at reporting date. The non-controlling interest value at reporting date. So we, so we all know that we are going to start with the fair value of the non-controlling interest at acquisition. So fair value at acquisition. It was given to us as 5,000. And remember that I told you that this fair value at acquisition replaces the stated, uh, the share of the pre-acquisition profit and the stated capital. It replaces that. So the only thing we need to factor is the share of the post-acquisition profit. And the post-acquisition profit is 3,900. So we say share of post-acquisition profit. And that is going to be 20% because NCI has 20% holding in the subsidiary. So that is going to be 20% of 3,900. And 20% of 3,900 is going to give us 780. So we are going to add 780 to that. This would have been it all. But remember that there was a goodwill impairment. And I told you that this goodwill was a goodwill for both parent and subsidiary. And therefore, we need to apportion the loss also against the value of non-controlling interest. So we say that share of loss or share of goodwill impairment. And the goodwill impairment is 2,000. So the same 20%, which is their percentage holding times the loss of 2,000. The loss is 2,000. So when you calculate, you're going to have 400. So you put that in bracket because you are subtracting. And so you take out 400 from that. And so it's going to be 5,000 plus 780 minus 400. And that is going to give us 5,380 as the value of the non-controlling interest at reporting date. So this is how to go by NCI at reporting date. And then finally, we are going to look at the group income surplus or the consolidated retained earnings as our final workings before we prepare the consolidated statement of financial position. All right, so the final working, working five, I'll call it group income surplus or consolidated income surplus or consolidated retained earnings. And then we are going to start as usual with that of the parent company. So parents retained earnings on the face of the trial statement of financial position. Now, looking on the statement of financial position, the balance for retained earnings for the parent is 25,200. So 25,200. And just as we know, we add their share of the post acquisition profit, just as we did for the NCI. So share of post acquisition profit. And the post acquisition profit is 80% of 3,900. We all know that the post acquisition profit is 3,900, and their share of the group structure is 80%. So 80% of 3,900 Ghana cities. 
and that is going to give us 3,120. And just as we attributed the impairment loss to the non-controlling interest, impairment loss will also come here. So impairment loss. That one too, they get 80% of the loss. 80% of 2,000. Okay, and that is going to be 1,600. Remember to put that in brackets. 1,600 because we are subtracting. This would have been eight. But remember that there was an unrealized profit, a provision for unrealized profit, which we calculated to get 200. Now, that unrealized profit must also reduce the income surplus. This was a case where the parent was selling to the subsidiary. And that is why NCR was not affected with the unrealized profit. If it was the other way around, where the subsidiary rather sold to the parent, would have found a share of that unrealized profit, subtract from the NCR value, before we share also 80% for the group. But because it was the parent that sold to the subsidiary, the entire unrealized profit will be taken from the group income surplus. And so we'll say unrealized profit on stock. And that was 200. Let's show the workings. It's, remember that I said it's 25 over 125. I changed the markup to margin. 25 over 125 times 1,000. The 1,000 is the goods that remain in stock. And that was 200. And I'm going to put that also in brackets. Okay. So we're now going to get our total value for the group income surplus. And that is going to be 26,500 and 20 Ghana cities. So ladies and gentlemen, we are done with the workings. We are now going on to present the statement of financial position consolidated itself. Now, remember that some most of these things have corresponding entries, especially with unrealized profit. We are also going to reduce it from the inventory. So let us take note of that. Now when we get to inventory, we are going to subtract the unrealized profit also. And then the depreciation adjustment is also going to affect the total non-current asset. The fair value will also be added. So when we get there, I'll show you what to do on that as well. Okay. All right, so we are going to prepare the consolidated statement of financial position for Evelyn Limited Group. So Evelyn Limited Group. We we'll say consolidated statement of financial position as at 31st December 2013. So we have our currency sign and then we are going to begin with the non-current assets. Now, with the non-current assets, the first one that we can see from the question is the property, plant, and equipment. And we have 33,400 and 2,400. So look at what we are going to do. So when we come here, we have PP, property, plant, and equipment, 33,400. We add across. Remember that we are adding across at this point. Plus, is it 2,400, 20,400? Then what we have to do is that we were told that the fair value adjustment of the plant was not recorded anywhere in the book. So we have to add 1,000 and then subtract 300 as a depreciation adjustment. Okay, so this is what we are going to show. And remember that everything you do here will be marked. So we check each of these ones before the final answer. So 33,400 plus 2,400, that is the parent and subsidiary, plus the fair value adjustment minus depreciation on the fair value adjustment. And that is going to give you a final figure of 54,500. And then the, the next one over there is the investment in Sophia, but that will not appear. I told you to be replaced by the goodwill. So we have goodwill, which is coming from work and trade. And the goodwill at reporting days was 4,400. So that is all for the non-current assets. So total non-current assets will be 58,900. So we, we show that. And then from there, we move on to the current assets. So current assets. Now under current assets, we have inventories. Remember that the unrealized profit will also affect the inventories. 
okay and so we have the inventories for both businesses 11,500 plus 6,800 so 11,500 plus 6,800 minus the unrealized profit of 200 very very important if there was any goods in transit it would have been added but in this case the difference was as a result of cash in transit if you can remember so we are going to deal with cash in transit but here remember to take out the unrealized profit from inventories just as i taught you in the adjustment and the final figure is going to be 18,100 then after that we have trade receivables trade receivables from the question we have 8,500 for parent 5,900 for subsidiary so 5,900 and then let us remember that we were told about the intragroup debt that the Parent Evelyn had 1,500 standing as receivables. And then the Sophia, the subsidiary had 1,100. And so those two must not stand. So we have to subtract 1,500 from the receivables. I told you that it will not stand. So it is the parents plus subsidiaries minus the receivable that is due from Sophia. We don't need that in the consolidated because of the single entity concept. And that is going to give us total trade receivables of 12,900. And then after the trade receivables, we have cash and cash equivalent, which is 5,000 for the parent, 2,900 for the subsidiary. So cash and cash equivalent, which is 5,000 plus 2,900. And once we are able, you see, so all the time, one of the things you need to do is once you bring the parent and subsidiary and add, Think of any other adjustment that will affect it. Over here, the cash in transit that I explained will affect that. And the cash in transit will rather be added. So it will not be subtracted. So 400. So we add the cash in transit. That is going to give us total cash of 8,300. And that is all for the current assets. So let us find the total of the current assets. And that is going to be 39,300. And once we have that, we estimate our total assets. The total assets is going to be the non-current asset plus the current asset. And that is going to give us 98,200 Ghana cities. All right. So having been able to establish the non-current asset, the total assets, then we move on to the equity and liabilities portion. So we begin with equity. And then under equity, we all know that the stated capital of the group will be only that of the parent company. We have spoken about this over and over again. So that is the parent company's stated capital, according to the question, is 40,000 Ghana cities at reporting date. And then we bring the group income surplus. The group income surplus from working five. We had 26,520. So that is going to give us a total of 66,520 Ghana cities. Please, these things are what we have done over and over. So I, I'm sure that uh, me going faster is not hindering your understanding. All right. And then we add the non controlling interest. So non controlling interest at reporting date. That is also from working for. We did that working. And the total value for non-controlling interest was 5,380. So when we add that, the total equity column is going to be, is it 71,000? Yes, 71,900. So now that we have the equity column to be 71,900, then we'll look for the liabilities. Now, in this question, we do not have any long-term long liability. The only liability we have is the trade payables, which is the, yes, the trade payables. So we only have current liability. So current liabilities. And under current liabilities, we only have trade payables. So what we need to do is that we bring that of the parent plus the subsidiary, and then we consider if there was any adjustment to be made. And truly, there was an intra-group debt, just as we have canceled 1,500 from the 
in receivables, we take out the 1,100, if you remember, from payables. So the parent company's payables was 17,200. And that of the subsidiary was 10,200. So minus 1,100, which is the intra-group debt that is being eliminated. And so that is going to give us total trade payables of 26,300. 26,300. So that is all for liabilities. There is nothing more for liabilities. And so let us find our total equity and liabilities. And that is going to be 71,900 plus 26,300. That is also going to be 98,200, which is the same as the total asset. So ladies and gentlemen, this has balanced. So that is it with a consolidated statement of financial position. I'm going to solve some more questions, okay? But we still have a lot to do on consolidations. So I'm not going to waste too much time on other questions for now. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to talk about consolidated statement of profit or loss. And when I'm done with that, I'll talk about accounting for investment uh, in uh, associate and joint ventures, okay? Which is still under consolidation. Then we can take a broader question that involves all the associates and then the joint venture issues. And then when we are done, we know that we are done with basic and then the basic consolidation. The next, because I told you this is a full series on this one. So when we are done with all consolidation, we also move on to advanced consolidation techniques, which involves the mixed group and then the, that is the sub-subsidiary and maybe the foreign subsidiary as well. So it is a long series that we are doing. So be patient with me. I may not stay only on this throughout. I may bring in other topics along the line because other people from other places are demanding other topics that I have to do, but I still remain focused to completing the consolidation. So that is it for now with a consolidated statement of financial position. The next consolidation video will be on the consolidated statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. We're also going to look at the consolidated statement of changes in equity. Remember to subscribe to this channel if this is your first time. Share this video. Let others also have a benefit. Together we grow, together we succeed. And until we meet again another time for another video, it is bye for now.